For years, California has been parched with an ongoing drought. Every winter, when the rainy season begins, there's the hope that this year there will be enough rain and snow to refill reservoirs, to raise the levels in the lakes and the rivers, to create an abundance of water that we need so desperately to grow the food that we grow and to nourish the beautiful natural places that we love so much in this state. Well, be careful what you wish for. It has been raining in California, really, really raining. For three weeks, storm after storm after storm swept across the state. This abundance of water is washing away everything from roads to homes. The thousands of unhoused Californians are the most vulnerable. And although I gratefully shelter in my home, this is the kind of storm that will reveal places of vulnerability that you didn't even know existed. That's what happened just a few days into this weather phenomenon. During a brief break in the rain, my partner went to retrieve something in the garage. When he opened the door, he found water all over the floor, damaging several boxes we had stored there. We started a hurried cleanup and salvage before the next storm, and I realized that the boxes that had been affected were the ones that contained dozens and dozens of gifts that my mom had given me throughout my life, a very large collection of musical figurines. You might be wondering why I had all of these figurines sitting in boxes on the floor of the garage. I actually have a very complicated relationship with these gifts from my mom. As I went through the damaged items, I experienced the combination of really missing my mom and also reflecting on my not completely positive feelings about these items she had given me. Welcome to this bonus episode of Art Heals All Wounds. During this break between seasons, I've taken the opportunity to either share or engage with other podcasters that I admire, the other hosts who do the work that inspires me as a host. The past two bonus episodes have been feed drops of shows that I like to listen to. This bonus episode is pretty much me inviting myself into the space of Reframables, a show hosted by Natalie and Rebecca Davey. I'm a big fan of the work they do on Reframables. Natalie and Rebecca are two sisters who have a gift of talking through an issue, either between the two of them or with a guest. They use conversation and inspirations from art and creativity to reframe those things in our lives that could really use some airing out, just like the contents of the boxes in my garage and my feelings about them. Next week is the first episode of season four, and I'm truly excited about the guests that I have lined up. Make sure to follow Art Heals All Wounds on your favorite listening app, but in the meantime, Enjoy this special bonus episode with the hosts of Reframables. Hi, Becca and Natalie. Thank you so much for joining me on Art Heals All Wounds. As you know from my email to you, I recently had a little incident arise that has left me thinking a lot about my relationship with my mom and I love what you do on your show, where you sort of talk things through and help people reframe things. So thank you for agreeing to come on Art Heals All Wounds to help me do that. Pleasure. Thanks for having us. So here in California, we're flooding. And recently, our garage flooded. And the main victims of the flood were a group of boxes where I had stored many gifts from my mom. For this to really make sense, I need to back up a little bit. My mom and I were very different people. And that throughout the years, especially into my, you know, from childhood into my early 20s, created some conflict. So she was very feminine in a traditional sense. The way she dressed, what she enjoyed 
doing were things that, um, especially when I was a kid, the gender roles were very, very rigid. So what she enjoyed doing were, you know, feminine things, being inside the house, cooking, crafting. I was not like this. I was what would be known as a tomboy at that time. And I loved being outdoors. I loved animals. I loved adventures. I loved all kinds of things that either she didn't do or didn't know how to do, like swimming, biking, uh, those kinds of things. And in particular, one place that we clashed a lot was over my clothes and my hairstyle, but also even things like taste in music and my interests. It was it was a recurring theme for us, and we didn't get each other. We just didn't get each other at all. And I would even be more specific and say, I felt she didn't get me, and I felt like I did get her and didn't want the lifestyle she was offering. My mom, one of the things that she enjoyed doing a great deal was collecting things. She collected a lot of things for herself, but at a certain moment, she decided that the rest of us needed to collect things as well, and that these would be things that she chose for us. So for my brother, she decided that he needed to collect nutcrackers, you know, like the little figurines that are also nutcrackers. So every Christmas, he knew under the tree for him would be a nutcracker in a different kind of outfit. My dad, she decided, was going to collect like these really specific clown figurines, all made by this one artist, a clown playing golf, a clown fishing, a clown doing whatever. But that was what my dad was going to collect. And for me, she decided that I was going to collect these little figurines that also play music. Like, so, you know, they're made out of porcelain or ceramics or something, and they have a little key, you wind them up, and they'll play some music. And these are always things that were just so far out of my aesthetic of what I would want to collect if I were a collector. You know, I have one that is Snow White and the Seven Dwarves that plays Someday My Prince Will Come. <laughs> <laughs> when I was growing up, my room was filled with shelves and shelves of these figurines. Hmm. And at a certain point when I became an adult and I moved, I got all these figurines in boxes, which I never unpacked. First of all, I don't have that kind of space in my house that I would have shelves and shelves that didn't have books or, you know, cookware on them. And second of all, I don't like them. But by the same token, I have never had the heart to just get rid of them. Hmm. Like I've held onto them and moved them from space to space to space. And they finally wound up on the floor of my garage. And then here in California, we've been having these crazy torrential rains for the last three weeks. And during the first big storm, our garage flooded. So, of course, the main thing that got the water were these boxes of these figurines. And I was in there with my partner helping to clean up this mess that was in the garage. And I looked at these boxes and I finally thought, you know what? There's maybe one or two that I might keep. The rest, I am finally going to get rid of them. But it just made me think so much about how my mom and I spoke very different love languages hmm. and started getting me wondering, like, what was this love language she was saying to me mm -hmm. <laughs> by giving me these things? For me, as a gift, they actually made me feel bad hmm. because it made me feel like she doesn't see me at all or she's trying to sort of change me or erase who I am. But I also know that my mom was an incredibly loving person. So I don't think she would be intentionally trying to make me feel that way. So I have just been pondering what love language was she speaking hmm. that I maybe now, even though she's gone, I could 
figure out to sort of reframe our our dynamic and our relationship. Hmm. Gift giving is a is that a specific mm-hmm. love language? It is, isn't it? It is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the Gary Chapman, yeah, the Gary Chapman name yeah. attached to love languages for people who haven't done that reading, I guess they can. It was how many how much time has it spent on the top of the the bestseller list? I mean, it's insane. But there's also been a lot of problematizing right. of the work in the years since it came out. So, we've got some We've got some stuff to do here, team, <laughs> in terms of like a reframing <laughs> exercise. Becca, what comes to mind for you like immediately? Because I'm curious to sort of, I've done maybe a bit more reading on love languages specifically, but when you hear it in your own experience with daughters and giving gifts and. Well, I mean, it is, it is fun to give gifts. That's for sure. So I can see what your mom, why it would have been. I mean, that Pam, I would, is, is gift giving a love language for you? It's not at all. Okay. Yeah. And I do enjoy it. Like I, but my daughter, like my oldest daughter has taken to being very, very specific. So this, this past Christmas, she made a PowerPoint for me of the things (laughs) so specific. So, and then I did enjoy, I mean, it was kind of funny because there was like, I, I'm not, I don't go super spontaneous for her because she's so specific. I'm just trying to please her in a way. So it's kind of the opposite of your mom who was doing, she was kind of pleasing herself, wasn't she? Like this was a fun activity that she could, that she liked to engage in. And then you were the recipient down at the end of the line, but it was really more for her or something. Yeah. Which is, which is interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I've been trying to think Mm. of. Like, what did she need? What was she trying to do within the dynamic of our family by creating other people's collections and then collecting for them? Yeah, she was curating stories. Yeah, and and she maybe wanted to be seen as the storyteller. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. So she was Mm -hmm. looking for some affirmation I wonder about look at how I'm I have vision for your life I'm I'm putting together yeah as you say not curating something for you that you will have forever this collection this so there is some love in that for sure that it's Mm -hmm. I'm preparing your future life that you will have although as you say you don't have seven wars But you know, it's interesting, Pam, Becca and I are getting ready to start with Reframables to do a new series and we're calling it Missed Moments. And we're really looking at like, I'm going to sort of, for people who are just listening to this right now, I've got my hands sort of coming at each other, but then at the last moment, something just kind of misses, right? And so one Uh. hand goes over top of the other and it's like, you think you're on the same path, but then something just sort of goes. And what's so interesting as I hear your description of your mom and then knowing you through this podcast is art is so much of what shapes you and your mom, it sounds like was curating sort of an aesthetic experience that was very much her. And so is there like kind of an art exchange that perhaps missed, but is that a, is that a potentially positive reframe, even as you keep a couple of the characters and sort of recognizing that? I mean, did she love art differently, but did she have sort of a relationship to art? Oh, she did. Mm. Oh, she did. Very, we had very different tastes, but Mm -hmm. Again, their house was filled wall to wall with paintings, photographs, various different types of crafts. And she herself was incredibly creative that she always denied. Hmm. Like she was an amazing seamstress. And just so many times when you needed something like very particular and you couldn't find it in the store anywhere. You could go with her and find a pattern that was sort of that and find fabric that was sort of that. And she would make that outfit for you. Hmm. And she could make that outfit for you. She made, handmade all these Christmas ornaments that were so, those for me are very precious and I have them up on my tree now, which I haven't taken down yet. Mm. But they are just like these beautifully sewn little 
figures, and they are all in a story. Like we there, we do have Snow White and the Seven Dwarves as well. These little handmade Christmas ornaments. We have the Wizard of Oz Christmas ornaments, um, and I love those. One of the things that I really, really loved about her is that any time that you and your friends or a you know Girl Scout troop or a Cub Scout troop needed crafts to do, my mom was on it and supplied those things. And I uh, that was one thing that I did love doing. I hated like the whole patterns or preconceived things about it, but we always had craft supplies and I was constantly making things with these craft supplies. They weren't the same sort of idea of, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, but it was like I might make a fort out of something, you know, that she had or, you know, all kinds of things because we had those on hand and she Mm -hmm. was very, very good at that and very, very patient with the mess you might make Mm. doing it, um, creating the time and the space for you to do it, you know. So she was incredibly creative, which she always denied. I would always tell her, you're so creative. She goes, oh, no, no, I'm not really. But she was. Hmm. Yeah. So maybe the, those sorts of collections also represent her. She didn't quite have the confidence in herself to pick an unusual piece of art that just kind of stands on its own. Right. So she's not, she's, she would maybe question herself, but she can feel confident in the, the art of these figurines. And the collection of them, right? Like seeing a theme that kind of run through. I mean, yes, it really does make her a curator. It's interesting, those people that say they don't have any, you know, they don't have a creative bone in their body, that type of, my mm-hmm. my father-in-law's partner says that type of thing, that she's not creative at all. And she's very creative. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just this lack of confidence in one's own aesthetic taste. So it's, I mean, in some ways that was picking collections that you, you, you don't have to worry about every year, you know, you're going to get those couple things and it's, she's not going to have to battle with herself it's going to feel there's going to something sure about it yeah and especially if the gift giving quote-unquote love language is strong in her or was strong in her then Mm. it would be much more about the giving than even about the process of the choosing it's like once i've got a plan now i can show my love in this very tangible way which is interesting because even as people you know can kind of problematize the love language as being not maybe nuanced enough as being sort of too divisive. Like it ends up, I think one recent mind body green article took issue with how people, how counselors have taken up the love language sort of categories, because they say that within couples who have read the book, then they end up competing. It's like, yeah, Mm -hmm. but I did more of this for you. So why aren't you matching with what you know is mine? And it becomes like a one upping thing. Right. But what's so interesting when you if you could if one could reframe how we make use of those like recognizing the gift giving abilities of our loved ones like a mother. And all three right. of us are moms here and so I mean I'm now I'm sitting here going, you know, I give Frankie a Christmas gift every year that's like specific to a, a future Christmas tree that I anticipate he'll have. I have no idea if they'll get hung on that tree. But I've enjoyed the process of giving them to him. So there is a part of me that wonders later on if that even matters, if he uses them, (laughs) because there's been something about the sharing of that moment. Although, I mean, it is like, I think we've got a good handle (laughs) on your mom, you know, in this like 10 minutes. Yeah, we've, we've, we've captured your mom, but what does that mean? (laughs) No, we haven't. But what does that mean for you? I guess. Yeah. Because what, what do we do with our disappointment when We can understand that someone's intentions were good. Right. Because it sounds like her intentions were good Mm -hmm. for you. I'm sure that, yeah, I'm sure they were, but I think it's important not to overlook the fact that we did have a lot of conflict Mm -hmm. around that. And, and I, of course, I'm, I'm the only person here who can give my side, Mm -hmm. but in my memory, it was not conflict for me saying, oh, mom, I don't like what you do. I don't like this. It was much more obviously in the parent-child dynamic, her feeling really, really just 
completely baffled and sometimes disapproving of, again, I, I mean, I went through, a, I would say, a goth light <laughs> phase um, where I only wore black. My hair would be dyed different colors, and I only wore um, lots and lots of silver jewelry. And this is the only time where I ever said to her that I did not like the gift she gave me. I mm. went home for Christmas because I was in college by that time. And first she had helped my brother pick out a gift for me, which was a pink Argyle sweater. <laughs> I was just like, what child were you expecting to come home? Because I have not, I've never worn this, but especially now that I'm so chic in my all black clothes, why would I wear this? And then, you know, I had like the multiple piercings, all the silver little rings in my ear and all this stuff. And she gave me this ring that was gorgeous, gold with all these sapphires and diamonds on it. Hmm. And I looked at it, I was like, whoa, how much did this cost? And I just had this sort of sick feeling of like, I'm going to take this very expensive ring and put it in a drawer somewhere because I would never wear this ring. And I said to her, in what I thought was like my nicest, politest way, wow, this is gorgeous. I really appreciate you buying this for me, but I will never wear this because it's not something that I wear. And boy, she was so upset. Mm -hmm. She snatched that ring back. I never saw it again. Mm -hmm. And we didn't talk about it for a really long time. We did talk about it like 10 years later. She was really upset and very hurt. And I couldn't get what was so hard for her. And I also, it felt almost intentional, like an intentional way of saying, I don't like how you look right now. Mm -hmm. And was it that? I don't know. I was definitely not mature enough to continue the conversation and say, are you picking out these gifts because you're unhappy with how I look? Although I knew she was because she would tell me otherwise just straight out like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't like how you look. <laughs> well, not in that way, but it's like, do you really have to wear that jacket? Do you really, have, you know, like that sort of thing. I think you're right on. You're just acknowledging that there was real disappointment for you that you've had to grapple with. So right. even if we can bring understanding to the other side, we still have to grapple with our own feelings, which right. are important. And yeah, yeah. I think one of my regrets was that I did often, especially as an adult, feel sort of like the odd person out in my family. Mm -hmm. They all sort of had very similar interests, hobbies, aesthetics, things like that, despite the fact that my brother was not happy getting the nutcracker every Christmas. But <laughs> in other ways, they shared a lot of common interests. And I never really felt like I was part of the gang. Mm -hmm. I felt very loved, but I didn't feel like I was part of the gang. And I think that there was a thing about those gifts that made me even feel more like, why can't I be different and be part of the gang? I think that was the thing that I wrestled with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like it exacerbated your loneliness. Yeah, sense. yeah, it did. You're kind, of, you're kind of describing for me like the classic artist journey of feeling mm -hmm. isolated and alone. Like why, why am I this way or why don't I fit in? Right. Right. I think who comes to mind for me, and I probably because of what this podcast focuses on, which is art, there's a really wonderful artist that I got the chance to interview back when I was doing some editing and writing for a publication that Rebecca used to put out into the world. And for that piece, I interviewed uh, an artist by the name of Charmaine Lurch. And at the time she was doing work in Toronto, she had a big exhibit that was a part of um, something at the AGO. And so that's the, the big national gallery in Toronto. And mm -hmm. so it was kind of a bit of a coup that we were able to get a conversation going with her. And her work at that time was very focused on historical black narratives in the Canadian context. Um, she's always remained with that focus through her whole artistic career, but of late, uh, so in the last couple of years, she's really spent time focusing on 
um, a little bit more of like an environmental artistic push with bees. So she's mm -hmm. been making these really amazing and like totally differing in sizes, showing up at different kinds of galleries, but these wire bees. So like imagine something that's maybe as small as your laptop and then might be as big as a chair, but there are these like wire sculptures that mm. are literally just, it's a bee. <laughs> so, and she's playing with the idea of the hive and community and how within that hive space, like there are needs that are met by all of the different bees that exist in that space. And I mean, I'm really simplifying what she would have much more to say about kind of a really large environmental angle to do with her art, but I'm just going to play with the, the community bit here for a sec, mm -hmm. because I think that there's something, and I don't want to dismiss the loneliness piece, <laughs> because mm -hmm. I think that that's so real. But I also think that the beauty of love languages of just gift giving in general of the gifts that we hold in who we are as individuals they may not be seen or received by the people that we want in the moment of perhaps their giving or their sharing but i think that through something like the art that you have shared on this podcast through something like lurch's bees i think that there's something really modeled for us about how there, the gift giving and mm. the love language is shared. They don't have to be missed and just only given in one direction. That there's, so, so like you may not have felt seen in those moments at those times with your family, but no doubt you have different experiences of being felt and seen in the way that you are and who you are with your own kids, with what you do on here, what you do in your life outside of podcasting. I mean, like we, we find our communities in, in teaching, we call them communities of practice, but I mean, like, is that perhaps a, a reasonable sort of bit of jargon that we could apply here, right? Like our communities of, of care that right where we can speak our real languages and feel heard and seen. And right. then, you know, there can be those little trophies of missed moments for like the ones you decided to keep from the garage, but then they can be kept for other reasons. But Nat, are you saying, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying and I really like it. So I, I wasn't seen, but now I can go on and really see the people in front of me. Yeah. And I also do wonder, yes, I definitely think that, but I also do wonder if uh, no, we may not all be fully seen in our past stories in the exact way that we wanted to be seen. But upon reflection, like a reflexive practice and just living might actually prove that there were times where we were and we just didn't recognize them because our our sight was so kind of honed in on the parts where things were missing. Like if you actually sat back now and had a car, I don't know. Pam, like, I'm not going to impose this and I'm not a counselor, but imagine if you sat down and had a conversation with your brother and chose to share some of like where you felt things were missed. And what if he was like, whoa, that was totally what I was feeling. Like, I have no idea. Right. But like, right. we just, we only know what we know until we choose to share and unpack. Yeah. But did you, did you see that moment when mom did see you? Yeah. That like you might, that you didn't see it, but I saw it for you. Here's a moment where I feel like she was really trying to yeah really see you and respond and maybe, maybe yeah he has that secret moment that he could give you yeah because Rebecca and I definitely do that for each other there will be moments where there's mm. something missed with a family member outside of each other and we can have a moment to vent but then the other can say well actually this is maybe another way to see that experience because here's what I saw from my vantage point and it's super useful and potentially helpful. And sometimes that comes in relationship, but sometimes it might come from the objects. Like, right. right? Like the bee, like the wire bee is doing the work to, to communicate something to Lurch's audience members. I wonder what could be communicated to you now through those objects as you let them go. <laughs> like, I, I wonder at that. Yeah. Well, I wonder too. Mm -hmm. And I also really was thinking about 
you know, there's there's a lot I could say about my mom's own, her childhood mm -hmm. and her feelings and other dynamics in the family that she was working on or not, but experiencing. And I do think one of you, maybe it was you, Becca, said something back, or maybe Nat, that, or you both agreed and expounded on it, <laughs> of curating this story. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I do think that there were challenges of connecting mm -hmm. in my family. And not just, that's the thing too, is that I, I'm seeing my own little tiny slice of the pie here in my feelings. But, you know, you can look at a family and say, oh, there were challenges maybe in every relationship about how do we connect. One thing that I do really know now after my mom passed away is that she was the connector in our family. Mm -hmm. And my brother and my dad and I, and I, in particular, have had to work really, really hard to do the emotional work that she did. Mm. Mm -hmm. What's really become clear to me is that, wow, she did all the emotional work in our family. You know, you always wish that you could be wiser than you were. I wish I had known mm. earlier how much emotional work she was doing for all mm -hmm. of us to create cohesion and connection. And it does make me think about wider community mm -hmm. and those same sort of issues, like who's doing the work mm -hmm. in the communities to create cohesion mm -hmm. and to, even if it's not always perfect, to at least attempt at a sense of belonging, a sense of story, a sense of history, like who's doing that work in the communities that we belong to. That's a good thing to think about because mm -hmm. I think that that was something I noticed and that that may be tied to this, this tradition, what you were saying, Nat, about giving your son these ornaments every year. For you, that's a story that's really important. Mm -hmm. And I would be willing to bet that one day it will be to him as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. not now, but maybe one day. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. And Becca, I just have to commend your daughter that she can come up with a PowerPoint. <laughs> She's so I smart, love that girl. <laughs> it's brilliant. <laughs> well, not not just the work, but just the the awareness to yeah, know yeah. that's it. Like this is what I want. I'm going to make this really clear to you. That's like an advanced level of self advocacy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> totally. Yeah. You know, I always think with her that the relationship, the mother-daughter relationship, it's so it's so vulnerable on both sides. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can see the way she looks at me. She'll say something, but looks at me just with, she wants my approval. Mm -hmm. she, right. But I want her approval too. <laughs> so oh, this that's back such and a good forth, point. like yeah. attempt to find each other and please each other and and is there maybe some sort of like, I don't know if this is, this is too, maybe I'm reframing too hard here, but <laughs> I wonder if there's like a really beautiful gift of grace that's been given in the flood <laughs> to like, you know, let you release something, but also like, and it almost makes me a little bit verklempt when I think, when I think, when I say the words, because just the idea that we can all try so hard to share in our relationships and those missed moments will still happen but mm. that like i don't know what is it art nature whatever finds a way <laughs> to like to sort of clear a path for something new in in the way that you move forward with your m memoried relationship of your mom and not really she does like to shed things so this is coming from someone who's like yeah should we burn that let's burn it <laughs> Let you go. <laughs> Let's be done with that. <laughs> I know. I know. I, I so relate to that. But I, I'm leaving a little part out, which was really interesting to me, is that there was another box of things that were damaged, and they were all old, crazy homework that my daughters did when they were in school that mm. I was saving for them because I just was like, oh, of course they're going to want to go back someday and see how cute their little poem was and, you know, mm. this drawing is just precious and all this stuff. So there was like a weird parallel that popped up there. It's like, okay, I may not collect for them, but I've been saving a box 
as well that someday they're going to have to figure out, oh, my God, what do I do with this box that my mom, you know, Mm -hmm. got this stuff that I now have. So it's an interesting intergenerational thing of Mm -hmm. believing that you're so, so different, but somehow you are kind of repeating a pattern that is doesn't have the meaning that you think it does. Like, who am I really saving these little tidbits yeah. of homework and artwork for? That's really powerful. That's a really insightful moment of self-awareness. Gary Chapman would be very pleased with you. <laughs> 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 Do you feel like somehow we all need to make altars hmm. of, of objects or little... Like, what could we do to tie up these? Like a memory altar? Yeah, more memory altar. I mean, I don't know if that's stealing from a tradition or if we can... What do you think, Nat? I think, well, you're thinking you're using the language of something. So I want to just dig into more what you mean by it. (laughs) Because, I mean, like commemorating things or you have Mm. a moment. Like, like, it's almost like this could pass you by, Pam, and maybe... Mm. You could create a ritual or a ceremony for yourself to close this door, acknowledge. I'm not really a big altar ceremony person, so but I, I feel like there's something there that I could, that maybe we could explore. Or even that that's what this episode is for you. Like now you've got this like recorded mm. conversation that honors this process that you've gone through. And then, yeah, now... You've got that really great squad cast shot. <laughs> of the three it's of your us. it's your altar. <laughs> no, but you know what? Like seriously, maybe there is something at the end of this where you go for a walk and then you Yeah. Let something go. What you said, Becca, about it's a two way street in terms mm-hmm. of seeking approval, seeking, you know, like, do you think, you know, is your being different from me rejecting me? which is kind of what I come up with that my Mm. mom maybe was feeling Mm -hmm. and that these Mm -hmm. gifts very much in her taste were sort of these attempts of like, but you still like who I am, right? Even if you're different. Mm. Yeah. So it is a way to see that. And Nat, you brought up community. How, How do we take this into the wider world in a way? Do you see ways? Yeah, I'm I'm trying to sort of like sum it up in my head with how I would see it. But I really, I think I'm going to go back to that language of both communities of practice and communities of care. And mm. I mean, care is what I tend to write about in terms of my, my sort of academic world. So I, I think about it a lot and a caring relation requires both a cared for and a, and a carer, but that the right. two are, are interchangeable. So that that does not always is the carer that role sometimes Mm. she's going to be the cared for and so when i take it back to lurch and the bees i really think that that is like the ultimate symbol for uh, like gift giving and sharing is we can't like every single one of our gifts in our communities of practice and care mean something Mm -hmm. to the making of of our worlds and and, and like the bounty that comes, right? All that honey that comes out of all of that work done together feeds, feeds more. If we can see our gifts as within our own little families feeding out into a wider sort of world of care, then I think that we are all on the right track. Best, you know, best of intentions or not, right? Like that's got to be right. something. Right. But I, and I also th- I think... Just jumping on that, it I think reflecting, mm-hmm. we have to reflect with patience and and grace and gratitude, I guess, with all of those things, because mm-hmm. we can't, because it's easy to get stuck in just pinpointing the bad stuff and how mm-hmm. they failed us because, you know, our parents did in certain ways. We all feel that and we're going to fail our own kids in certain ways. So 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 trying to find the the good intentions and the love that mm. was there i mean it sounds so kind of airy fairy but it's seems pretty key if you're going to be able to spread that out into the world is to gently reflect <laughs> yeah if we're going to hang out in this hive together for a little longer then <laughs> we better be able to <laughs> to see each other's best intentions because <laughs> right. yeah. it's crowded here 
So. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Wow. Those are both very lovely thoughts. And I'm so grateful that you both were willing to reframe this with me today. Oh, yeah. It's an interesting dilemma that you shared. So thank you for sharing it. Yes. Yeah, thanks for trusting to trusting us to have a a thoughtful conversation. You made a great space for that, Pam. I know your work, so it was easy to trust. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Thank you so much to Natalie and Rebecca Davey of Reframables for talking me through my own reframing that I needed. Guess what? Reframables is starting with a whole new season. You'll love the insight they bring, both from their deep immersion in the practices of art and creativity and the experience of their lives. I've been told that the last best form of communication that we have as humans is through conversations, and the work that Nat and Becca Davey do on Reframables makes me believe it. Look for their show wherever you find your podcasts. I'll also include links to all of their social in the show notes. And I am also starting a new season next week. I hope you'll join me. Don't forget to follow Art Heals All Wounds and be in touch on any of my social media or through my website, artheelsallwoundspodcast.com. The music you've heard in this podcast is by Ketza and Lobo Loco. The sound effects you heard in the opening were found on Pixabay and were created by Julius H. This podcast was edited by Eva Hristova. Art Heals All Wounds comes to you from Oakland, California, on unceded territory of the Chokenyo Ohlone people.